Sometimes you just need to say, cool, band, cool, band. Man, did you see Michael's new upright bass? Whew. How many of you didn't notice that? How many of you did notice it? Looks like there's plumbing on the back of it here. <laughs> James got a little bit going over there on the piano, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. James is feeling comfortable. Now, is there tr truth to the fact that James does a, a, a an Elvis impersonation? Is there truth to that? <laughs> Nobody's moving. Nobody's moving on that one. <laughs> But they are smiling, okay. We might have a Elvis at Christmas. I can hear it now. <laughs> Christmas is um, no perfect formula for it, and I heard somebody reference recently how they, uh, some advice that they received. It was, you just put your mind in neutral, and you go where you get shoved, and uh, I, whereas I think that is sometimes true, I think it's an awful way to think about it. And so I kind of want to prepare you for the onslaught. And the onslaught is, and, and believe me, I'm one that loves the onslaught. I mean, I love the celebration. I love all that Christmas is in its right, you know, its right place. I do think we get out of in left field with it sometimes, and we we kind of lose what our focus is, but. My hope and my encouragement to you today would be that we don't get shoved in the direction of Advent, that we really do make it all that we want. So let me just encourage you, don't go for the Christmas rush, the hectic pace, the heavy traffic, the long lines, the frayed nerves, and all those other things. What we're hoping we'll do by the end of the service today is give you a kind of formula, if you would, to be able to maintain uh, Advent hope through uh, all of Advent. So don't just endure the season. Right now, decide, reflect, determine in your mind that you are going to enjoy it, you're going to relish it, you're going to savor it, that you, in fact, are going to celebrate and learn and share and listen to all that the Christ child says to us during this time. Now, the, the difficulty and the pleasure of Christmas and Advent and all that we talk about during this time is that it is a familiar theme. The difficulty is it's familiar. The difficulty, the beauty of it is it's familiar. So what we're going to do is talk enough about the familiar, but also accentuate uh, the, the fact that we get to enjoy the familiar and get to re uh, re kind of rehearse and relive the experience again. So in, in part of rehearsing and reliving that, Luke 1, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 26 uh, we're going to read it, but today we're going to read it from a different translation. We're going to read it from the message translation. So it's one that you've heard, but not perhaps in this translation. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. And upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful. Inside and out, God be with you. And she was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God is a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. Call his name Jesus, and he will be great, be called son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule Jacob's house forever, no end ever to this kingdom. And Mary says to the angel, but how I've... Never slept with a man, and the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy, Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is, and everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, Yes, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. And then the angel left her. You see, we've got to understand the details of the story. 
we've got to understand that it is not an easy story to swallow. If this story is easy pickings for you, then I don't think you've looked at it closely. It is not an easy story. It is a story that stretches us. And whatever you may believe about this story, you believe this one thing. Mary believed everything that she said here, and those that were around her believed it because they recorded it. And those that went on beyond that recorded it. We have story after story surrounding this reality, and now we have decades and centuries to reflect on the experience that the writers of the New Testament believed with their hearts and their minds that this story was the way that it was. When you think about hope, you think about uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least those of us who study it. When you look back in the Old Testament, you see a man by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah was the hope prophet, if you would. Now, things were not so hopeful in his time, and so... What we find him is looking around and God tapping him on the shoulder and saying, I need a prophet to speak a word. And so he says, yes, Lord, send me. I will do that. And so in the midst of a time when his country was not doing well, they had fallen away from God, they were now under a severe chance of kind of losing their way in the world with God. And so he was called out. And so when we hear about the birth of Christ, we hear about it from the reflective moments of the Old Testament when Isaiah is saying, God has sent me to be a prophet to the world, and he, he looked into the future, which we now see in the New Testament, and it was in the New Testament that Isaiah had, in fact, been looking toward. And then we find Mary, the story that we surround here. We, we get all caught up in the fact that we, in the pageantry and in the cards and the nativity scenes that we see, but in fact... This was hard stuff reality here that we're looking at. Think about it for a moment. Think about the whisperings behind her back, the pointed fingers, the false accusations that Shirley would have said. Can you imagine there was Facebook back then, all that people might have been saying in relationship to her, the raised eyebrows, the questions, the gossip, the criticism, the family pressures that she felt, the cruel jokes and laughter that surrounded that whole experience, the poverty, the heavy taxes that was, that was on them, the journey, and then ultimately the birth in a stable. Now remember this, that she was a teenage girl. She was a, from a very poor family, and here it was that she was literally engaged, which meant that if, in fact, she and Joseph broke up, that they would literally have to go through a divorce because the engagements then were taken very, very seriously. And they would have had to go gone through a divorce. And by the way, a woman couldn't ask for a divorce. Only a man could. So it was a man's world and not a very kind place for a woman. So the theme of the whole story is this. That Mary was a person of hope who obeyed God's word, who listened to God's word, and in fact did God's will in her life. And from the most complicated, awkward of situations, Mary found a way to find hope. So how are we going to, to do the same? How are you and I going to find our hope in Christ at a time when it gets awfully confusing? Not only with the busyness of the seasons, but with the heaviness of our lives, we tend to collect things through the years. We collect angers and griefs and frustrations, and when we find ourselves stumbling into Thanksgiving and Christmas, too many times we come burdened down with the past with stuff that we've hung on to, with things that we need to have forgiven and gone on with, and we just found our, uh, find ourselves stumbling into Christmas. So how are we going to find the kind of hope that Isaiah and Mary uh, had in their own lives? Let's, let's work on that together. First of all, hope comes from hearing. It is possible. As a matter of fact, it is likely, and it is incredibly powerful when you and I learn to tune our ears into hearing God. Now, I will admit to you that it is a little scary when some people say that God speaks to them all the time and that all the time they, they talk about it, as long as they fit it into their category that God told them this and this is the way it is, and sometimes it doesn't jive at all with the way in which we've seen things. So I, I understand that there are moments when we... Uh, listen to folks talk about hearing from God, and it's such dramatic uh, 
kind of conditioned way of hearing it that it's that it's a little fearful but I would rather take my chances on hearing God and doing the best I can to respond to that than thinking that I'm not able to hear God so hear me clearly when I say to you I think God still speaks to us and he speaks to us in a myriad of ways I think God speaks to us in worship service I think God speaks to us in songs I think God speaks to us through the spoken word uh, I think God speaks uh, in other people to us. I don't know what I would uh, what I would do with my life if God didn't speak to me. When I went to visit Betty McCoy the other day, I mean, I felt like God was in those in that conversation with us. Here was a lady who's losing her memory very quickly, but who has so many fond memories of this church and what this church has meant to her. And even though her, her circumstances are difficult, uh, we don't, you know, it's, she's almost like 40 minutes away from us, and not many of us are able to see her. She loves visiting and, and visiting the memories of that. So her hope is bound up in the fact that she has heard God speak to her through the years, and she is not going to stop that from happening in her life. There, <clears throat> think about the power of listening. If you... If you and I, think of a learning anything where you did not first have to listen to somebody. Learning and listening are absolutely connected. And if you and I are lifelong learners, which I, I really am, I love to allow God to help me to learn something, particularly as it relates to my faith. So when I thought, thought about this whole listening thing, I obviously did some research, and The Lost Art of Listening is written by a guy by the name of Michael Nichols, and he defines listening with a big definition of listen there. He says to listen is to, and he, he categorically gives some of the things. He says to listen is to pay attention. Now that's, that goes without saying, I think. And then he digs deeper, to, to take an interest, to care about, to take to heart. And then he gets with, into some words that I think are really powerful. To validate, to acknowledge, to be moved, and ultimately to appreciate. So listening means that we remain open and that we have not reached a conclusion that closes our decisions and our mind and our opportunities off. Imagine how many times God speaks to us and because we're busy with our own kinds of decisions and our own kinds of inclinations and our own kinds of prejudices that we miss really hearing what he's saying. In 1870, uh, there was a story, and I did the research on it to make sure because I had heard the story a long time ago. There was a Methodist group that was meeting in Indiana. It was their annual conference, and the conversation between the president of a college who was addressing uh, the assembled Methodists that day went something like this. The president says, I think we are living in such exciting age. I think we are going to see things happen in our lifetime and right now that are just unbelievable. And so there was, uh, as there always was, there was a presiding bishop at this meeting, and he was intrigued by the president's remarks. And so he questioned him. He said, what do you see? What specifically are you talking about? What kind of new things are you uh, referencing? And so the president of the college said, well, all kinds of new things. I believe we're coming into a time of great inventions. And he said, matter of fact, in this year, 1870, I believe, for example, that one day we will be able to fly through the air like birds. And the bishop just kind of couldn't believe what he was saying. He says, you believe that one day we'll be able to fly? And the college president says, yes, I do. And the bishop said what is now infamous, why that is heresy, just plain heresy. The Bible says that flight is reserved for the angels and that the angels alone Enough of that drivel. We will have no more such talk about that flying. What a ridiculous idea. And you know what? The rest of the story, when the conference was over, that same bishop went back to his home where he had a wife and two small children. Their names were Orville and Wilbur Wright. <laughs> and so we begin to know the rest of the story. Those that learn to fly were in fact his sons, and they obviously uh, made him a believer that you need to listen very closely to those that are around you. 
in my thinking about staying attuned to God, I kept thinking about uh, a mother's intuition this week. I even did some research on it. And, you know, it's not scientifically provable from what I can see, although there are several books written that lean in that direction. And they would simply say there is a kind of intuitive sense that mothers have. And the reason I believe that is that I remember when our firstborn came along, uh, Nicholas came along, you know, all the things about having a firstborn, you know, you take them home and you just can't believe it. And we, we had a small apartment at Southern Seminary at the time, and we put him in the back room uh, next to the washer and dryer, by the way. You know, we had one of those small washer and dryer rooms behind a little closet door, and we didn't run him at the same time, for those of you who think we were brutal to him. But there he was in that little cozy room that Neva had decorated so beautifully for him. And I will tell you, and I have got some stare downs in the first service when I related this, but I never remember Nicholas waking me up one time. In all those early years, I, I think he cried pretty regularly. Oh, excuse me, I'm kidding you. He did cry very regularly, but I did, you know. And so I, I don't think I'm a bad person, but I do think that Neva, I mean, she even told experiences she could she remembered being in the hospital when they would be creaking those, those little, uh, you know, when they're bringing the baby to you, those little wheels turning, and she kind of knew that it was her boy coming. And there's always been an intuitive sense. Neva always had this intuitive sense. And I think that has gone now into it. I didn't tell the rest of this story, but now we can be on FaceTime with Nicholas, and he's, you know, he's done very well with his business and all that. And if he says anything like, well, it looks like we're going to need to, to do this and hire some more people and you know borrow some more money and she said well, how much you know I don't ask those kind of questions and she'll say well how much are you going to spend and, and she he talks about buying a house the other day she well how much is the house going to cost and I keep thinking I don't ask those kinds of questions but a mother's intuition is also taken as a mother's permission to do whatever she wants to do when she wants to ask some uh, ideas about that so there is a sense of hearing and a sense of touching a person's life that is intuitive now if i believe that that that's true and i do then i believe that you and i can have a learned experience in our walk with christ that makes us intuitive to god's presence and that i think you and i do not need to accept the fact that we can go through this advent season and not hear god speaking to us i believe Mary heard him crystal clear, or she could not have done what she did. So hope comes from hearing. Secondly, hope comes from willing, willing. In the New Testament Greek, there is a word, pistis, and it is a great word because it's used over and over again about faith, but it literally means not simply head faith, but heart faith and active faith, how you connect the two together. It is believing obedience. Not just believing, but a believing obedience. It means you do something with the faith that you have. You, are, you move from just having some nice ideas and almost doing something to doing something about your faith. I'm a, uh, a big fan of uh, Charlie Brown and the whole Peanuts cartoon. And recently I saw one where Linus, was, who had been evidently the statistician of their a baseball team and so they had gathered together and they were giving the statistics from the season and Charlie Brown of course was listening to the final report with some sense of regret it went something like this Linus reported he says I've compiled the statistics on our baseball team for the last season in 12 games we almost scored a run in nine games the other team almost didn't score before the first out in right field Lucy almost caught three balls and once almost made the right play and then Linus says Charlie Brown we led the league in almost and isn't that the case we Christians almost connect the dots of our faith we we get it in our heads and we feel a palpitating of our hearts to a point of saying you know what I feel God's presence but when do we really put it together hope comes from willing that we're going to do something now, it's not going to surprise you that I did some research. I've, been, well, I've, I've long been intrigued by willpower um, because I've often thought I could discipline myself to do most anything. Uh, 
you know, I've gone through disciplines in my life, but I've never been able to discipline my, my Christian faith to walk it perfectly. And so I've always seen the chasm through which God, uh, when God shows me I need to be and what I am. But this whole idea of willpower, I've been listening to a book and now I'm, I'm reading it. That's, that's kind of an interesting way to, do, to read books now is I can listen to them while I walk and then read them and you know a lot more about them when you're reading them after having heard them. But there's a book called The Willpower Instinct. And it is a very intriguing book and I'll just give you a little two, two pieces out of it that I find interesting. Uh, they quote that the American uh, Psychological Association uh, came up with what it, I think is not surprising, but that we Americans name lack of willpower as the number one reason why we fail at our goals. Now that's not surprising to me at all because many of us do lack in the willpower. But what he does uh, in this book is he talks about, divides our brain up into the I will, I won't, you know, the I will and the I won't, and the I want, W-A-N-T. And he believes that we, in fact, can, through exercises and through meditation, develop our willpower stronger. And what I found interesting out of, a, get, get this, uh, one of the studies used in the book came from where? Down the road in Lexington, University of Kentucky. They had been doing a study, and what the, the study showed was that instead of having a fight or flight response when we're dealing with things that are going on in our life, you know, you either fight or, or, you, or flight you take, that, that we can develop our willpower to have a pause and plan response. Now, wouldn't that be nice? To have a pause, wait a minute, time out, and plan response. And that is one of the things that I think this time of the year, if we're going to have the kind of hope that has a willpower connected to it, we're going to have to learn to pause and to plan before we react negatively. Thirdly, hope comes from trusting. Now, this one's not a surprise. We trust, you know, I mean, I trust that this chair is going to hold me when I sit down. I, we trust that things all throughout the day, we trust certain people with our lives uh, we trust certain people with our hopes and our dreams. And so trusting is not a surprising thing for us in terms of looking at hope. I thought of a captain, uh, a, a story of a, of a captain who had been um, a captain on a, a riverboat for years and years and years, about 35 years. And somebody asked him at the end of, near, his, near the end of his career, they, one of the passengers said, after all these years of navigating the river, surely you know by now where all the rocks and where all the sandbars are. And his response was interesting. He said, no, but I know where the deep water is. In other words, he knew that no matter what would happen, he wasn't going to look for those things that would hold him back. He was going to put his energy in the place where he knew he could get through. So many of us, we look at the, all the, you know, the sandbars and the, the things that block us, when in reality, we do know that there is a way through all of that if we, in fact, can find a way to commit ourselves to it. You all know of my absolute um, love for Fred Craddock, and um, he's probably had more influence on my life than any one person, probably. And I only met him, I think, once or twice but I've heard him numerous times. He came to Southern Seminary when I was a student, and then I went to a seminar that he um, held at Princeton one time. And I've, I've just watched and listened, and, and, and he's been a powerful influence. So whenever I'm, you know, I don't know, whenever I need sustenance for myself, I almost always go back and read something that Fred or Bob, Bent, uh, Bob Benson, uh, those guys have just so impacted my spirit. I went back and pulled out one of his stories this week as I was looking for something on the issue of trust. And one of the stories I'd never used of his because I wasn't completely sure uh, how it angled to what I was looking for until I read it this time. And it's the story of a young lady, um, a, a little girl and her, her teacher in a rural uh, school in Tennessee. And he tells about it. It's a, it's a small village. and. Every morning when the bell rang at 8.30, the, you know, the students would wait till the very last minute to, to walk into class. But at 3.30 when the bell rang for them to leave, they all rushed out except for one little girl. 
and that little girl would hang close to her teacher. She would, she would, she would remain uh, after class to clean the board and to, to dust the erasers to help the teacher put away the materials. You've known little uh, kids like that. They were all eyes and ears for their teacher. And one day the teacher was teaching, but the class was not really into it. They had been noisy and disruptive throughout the day. And said, Fred, surely enough, this little uh, girl was made uh, as an example. And so the teacher stopped the class and said, I want you to look at this little girl in the front row here. Why can't you all be more like her? She comes early to help. She stays late to help. And all day long, she is attentive and courteous. And she ended up having, the teacher did, a conversation uh, back and forth with one of the students who was brave enough to, to respond to that. And he says this, it is not fair for you to ask us to be as she is. To which the teacher said, why is it not fair? He says, because she has an advantage. I don't understand, said the teacher, what is her advantage? And the word that, he, that she said was very interesting, that he said, she is an orphan. Now think about that. No wonder I had skipped over that a number of times in my brain, because the fact that she was an orphan simply told them that she had an advantage because her what her need level for her teacher to supply for her what she needed was very high. Oh, that you and I would have a need level for God to satisfy that we would come as orphans. So very needy to belong to something and somebody. I've been around folks who were adopted long enough to know that that is an incredible moving time. I've told you about my experience with my friend who adopted a young girl in Russia and, and, and how they, they had to actually say, does anyone else in this room want her? And that little teacher was, act, uh, that teacher was acting with that small child in a way that said, I know you need and I'm going to be able to provide that for you. It's a powerful thing. You see, we, we put so many layers of separation between what we really need from God. Oh, I can solve that. I can write a check for that. Or, oh, I can go to the doctor and they can give me some medicine for that. Oh, I'll just get another friend. It doesn't matter. Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I don't like that person, so I'll just exclude them. We, we have so many layers between us and God that we kind of protect ourselves so that we don't ever really, really have to trust God with everything. When I was reading this story, I went back and reflected on um, Fred's passing about a year or so ago. And I remember reading uh, what one of the students, one of his students went to the funeral and, and wrote an article um, that was published, I believe, in, uh, by CNN. And in there, he, he took a quote that I had not heard from uh, Fred. Fred used to say, he said, when I was in my late teens, I wanted to be a preacher. When, in my, when I was in my late 20s, I wanted to be a good preacher. When I was older, I wanted more than anything else to be a Christian. To live simply, to love generously, to speak truthfully, to serve faithfully, and to leave everything else to God. The only I get, the more that really sounds the way it ought to be to live simply, and to love, and to hope. So what is the to-do list I'm going to give you? The to-do list for Advent hope, to have an Advent hope, is slow your pace down. Slow down. Tell me something you do fast that couldn't be done better a little bit slower. Slow down your pace to ensure that you do some what I would call holy hearing. Secondly, I would say commit your will, your will power to receive God's power. Commit your will to God's power, and that's the best kind of will power. And then trust God with every feeling and experience that you have. There is no feeling of anger or frustration there is no feeling of unforgiveness or love that you cannot trust to God to take that feeling, that experience, and to get you through 
because hope is not something you wish for. Hope is something that Christ gives us to live on. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we are a grateful people. We have listened and we have sung and we have seen candles lit and we have, in fact, participated in a service today, a worship service that that takes all of our hopes and thoughts and energies and focuses them on the possibility of this thing called hope. So be with us as we stir an openness to a sense that you are not only among us today, but that you want us to take a trip to Bethlehem and that you want us to see a Christ child. And upon seeing the Christ child, you want us to have a hope that extends beyond us what we can produce for ourselves. Stir us, Father. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As always, we have a song we're going to sing. And if you have a decision to make or something you want to share with me public, pu- publicly, personally, come down. I'll be down here to pray with you. Uh, maybe you want to be a part of this fellowship. You've never joined, but today you'd like to formally do that. Uh, maybe you've not accepted Christ and never publicly professed a faith in Christ. Whatever it might be, we have a time where you can come and share that. Let's stand together and sing.